Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Pam Munter, author of the new book, Fading Fame, Women of a Certain Age in Hollywood. Pam, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks, Jeff. I'm delighted to be here. Sure. Well, if someone hasn't yet heard about your new book, Fading Fame, how would you describe the book? The book is a series of 10 short stories and two short plays about women who have aged out of Hollywood, basically. They've gone through the whole Me Too thing in their youth, and now they're cast aside for younger women. And the story is about how they cope with that. They've devoted their entire lives to, to this pursuit. It's been a core to their identity, and now that has been ripped away from them. And so what led you to write Fading Fame? I was in an MFA program on creative writing and writing for the performing arts as a nonfiction major, really. Nonfiction is all I've ever written or read, honestly. And I wrote a memoir while I was there called Alone As I Want to Be a couple of years back. And when I got into the program, the director said, you know, you have to have a second genre. I thought, oh, man, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I don't have a second genre. But, you know, <laughs> you don't have a choice if you, if you want to be in this program. So I started catching up, you know, all these years of not reading fiction. And then I thought, you know, I have a wealth of knowledge about old Hollywood. And I wonder if I could transform some of those wonderful people into fictional stories. And I had to do one of them for a class. I only had to do one short story. And it turned out to be the first short story in the book, actually. It's about Mary Pickford and Frances Marion, who was her screenwriter. I don't know if your listeners know who Mary Pickford was. They should. Mm -hmm. she was the first uh, woman executive person who ran her own studio back in the 1920s. She was known as America's Sweetheart, big, probably the biggest, most famous woman in the world at one point. She's unfortunately pretty forgotten now. But I speculated. I knew about her life because I had read all about it. And I knew about Frances Marion because she was a screenwriter who won two Academy Awards, actually. And they did work together. So I thought, you know, what if they wanted more? What if Frances wanted more from Mary than just a screenwriting credit? <laughs> so my brain just sort of took off with that and created a fictional story. When I got done, to my surprise, my classmates loved it and the teacher liked it. And somebody in the class said, you know, you ought to write some more stories about people like that. I thought, nah, you know, this is it. This is a one-off. I'm you know, not a fiction writer. Da -da 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 -da. I'm going to let it go. But then the following week, this is related, believe it or not. I had major knee surgery and I couldn't move very well. And mm. so the letter carrier started delivering the mail to my house, which was wonderful. And when she delivered it, we talk. And she said, you know, I, I'm changing my routes, and I'm very sad about it because I got to know all of these people on my route. And I thought, oh, oh there's got to be a story here, a woman male person who gets to know her people. I've been wanting to write about Joan Davis, who's a television and vaudeville star for years, and had written about her, actually, at one point. I thought, how can I make this into a Joan Davis story? And, of course, I did. <laughs> so it just kind of fell together. And I had done two plays with the same feminist, ageist theme. And I decided, let's, let's just keep this process going. Uh, you know, it took about, oh, I don't know, three years or so to get all the stories done. I had no intention of a collection until... It was a collection, yeah, but it was a one-off. You know, I got each story published as it came out, and I was thrilled. And, uh, you know, that was enough for the, for the moment. Well, um, I'm curious if you have ever listened to the podcast, You Must Remember This, given your oh, yeah. interest in old well, Hollywood. Yes. There are lots of uh, podcasts, actually, about old Hollywood. Well, yes. I've on some of them, actually, and it's just been wonderful to know that they exist and these people will be remembered 
Well, why, why do you think Hollywood celebrates youth? Because even if you look at it from a purely commercial point of view, there is an audience for movies that feature older women. Well, there is now. Uh, there wasn't then. Um, we have always, you know, partly because it's a different time in Hollywood. You know, it's hard to remember a time when there was no 24-7 news cycle. <laughs> right. And all we knew about movies came out of movie magazines. And all of that information flow came from five major studios that were run by five white men who controlled everything. And they had their, their own casting couch process. And sure. nobody wanted to bed an old lady. You know? And so if you wanted to get to the top, it was through the casting couch door back then. Gotcha. Well, you've done a lot of different forms of writing, short stories, plays, essays, and memoir. Do you have a favorite form? Well, I'm basically a nonfiction writer. I mean, I, I keep com coming back to that. And the kinds of choices I've made in my life uh, have made my life interesting to others, I think. And so I'm still writing memoir essays. And now I'm writing a little more about the writing process because I'm finding that people like you and your listeners want to know more about how how to write and what that process is like. And I've enjoyed jumping into that, really, for the first time. Well, I'm curious, what choices have you made in your life that has made it interesting? And <laughs> oh, Well, let me think here. Um, <laughs> Uh, I know that's a pretty broad writing. question. <laughs> it is a very open-ended question. How long do we have? Yeah. Uh, I started writing when I was about nine. Uh, I put on a newspaper in the neighborhood, <laughs> which, of course, delighted them, as you can imagine, of, about the neighborhood and about baseball, which intrigued me at the time. And as I got older, I got into journalism. Um, I wrote for newspapers. Oh, I wrote was the editor of the school paper. When I got to college, I really had a brain, which was a bit of a surprise. And I started majoring in things like political science, which I ended up teaching in the late 60s, uh, which was a wonderful time to be a political science teacher. It was very scary and very eventful, full of uh, awful times and good times. I was in the Peace Corps. Um, I came out and became a psychologist, actually. I went back to school, got a PhD in clinical psychology, and was in private practice for about 25 years. Saw a lot of celebrities, which was ironic, to say the least, since I had always wanted to be a celebrity. <laughs> um, and wrote about celebrities during that time. When the practice closed, uh, which I closed because of Managed care it was just uh, feeling really awful to be sure. hard way whole movement, unethical almost. When I closed the office, I jumped into show business. I, I thought, this is it. This is my only chance. So I studied singing. I studied acting. I did films, independent films in Portland, Oregon, where I was living. Um, I toured around the country with a jazz cabaret show. I made two CDs, one of them uh, at Capitol Records in Hollywood. Well, uh, and in the process of all of this, I collected six academic degrees. So <laughs> it's been an eventful life, to say the least. Yes. And people, people find that intriguing, I think. So you mentioned this creative writing program earlier. What was that experience like for you? Well, it was a low residency program, which was perfect. Uh, you know, there were two long 10 day meetings twice a year mm -hmm. and uh, it was perfect. And in the meantime, you uh, collaborated and communicated via the computer, which was great. I think most of the people who were in those programs have one another life. Certainly I did too. I was uh, performing actually sure. at the time I was doing it. Um, it was good. It, it's surprising how easily and quickly you can bond with somebody who's going through the same process, even though you don't see them very often. And some of my best friends really have come out of that program. 
Well, I'm glad I did it. I, when I went in, I met with the director and I said, you know, I just want to take a couple of classes. I wanted to get the juices flowing again. I'd been a long, long period of time when I wasn't writing much. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, we can't do that. It's all or nothing. So <laughs> apply and take your chances. So I thought, okay, why not? <laughs> so I did. And of course, I really got a lot out of it. I mean, I never would have written plays. I never, certainly never would have written Fading Fame or probably the memoir if it hadn't been for that program. So since then, That's great. you know, I've, I've been published probably 150 times in the last four years. So it did open the spigot. <laughs> <It did that. laughs> so what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories or novels or plays or essays? Well, they're different, I think. You have to find your own tempo and your own way of writing. You know, there are people who sit down and discipline themselves to write 1,500 words a day or something. I, that would make me crazy. I don't function that way. I'm an incubator. <clears throat> Once I get an idea, it has to foment in my brain for a while before I can sit down and write anything. I think it's to, to trust your own process, whatever that might be. I mean, some people outline. I don't do that. I, again, that would, that would restrict me in my own rebellious way. <laughs> I don't think I could do that. But the process is different. When I was writing plays, in a way, they wrote themselves. It was the easiest thing I did, even though it was not easy to begin it because I'd never done it. Mm -hmm. But once I established the characters and their relationship, I let them speak on paper. And uh, they took me into places I hadn't expected to go, which was fun and unexpected. That's great. Well, what are you writing now? I'm doing some essays. As I mentioned, I'm doing uh, some fading fame-related writing for uh, guest blogs. Uh, I'm enjoying seeing what comes out. Uh, probably no more fiction. I think I have pretty much run the gamut of that. I'm really happy with what came out. Um, but it's not my native soil, you know. <laughs> uh, sure. So I, I'm... Very pleased that the reviews have been as, as good as they've been and that people are buying the book. But uh, I need to go back to where I'm most comfortable. Sure. Well, what novels or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed? Well, I'm a big Robert Carroll fan. Uh, you know, he's written extensively. Mm -hmm. uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson. I'm still waiting for his last. I hope it comes out before he just dies. He's very yeah, elderly. I I, oh, man. It, um, I just finished reading Gary Giddens' latest uh, installment of Bing Crosby's biography of the war years, which was, I'm not a Bing Crosby fan, but I'm a biography fan, and he does write so very well. I have written or read books about uh, Michael Curtis, the actor, who was quite a lech, I've discovered. I had no idea. Well, um, biographies, the Biden. The latest biography about um, Lady Bird Johnson is just excellent, as is the one about um, sort of back scenes people, Ida Coverman, who was uh, the executive secretary, quote unquote, of Louis B. Mayer, who ran MGM for decades. Mm -hmm. well, she was really the power behind the throne. And so reading her story was fascinating. And in a similar vein, a book about Joan Harrison, who served the same function for Alfred Hitchcock, was very well done and put her name in the history of anything Hitchcockian. I mean, she was brilliant and produced his television series for years. So there's a lot of good stuff out. I, I have to admit, I'm a true crime fan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So when I, I get tired of biography, I'll go to true crime. I, I still love Anne Roll, even though she's long dead. I think her work is just untouchable in terms of being gripping and well done. And I think she mentored Greg Olson, who's also an excellent true crime writer. I'm reading all the time, and I, uh, you know, because I do, I'm sure there'll be more writing to come. Because as you know, if you read, you're more likely to write. Right, right. 
Well, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your books and your writing? Sure. I'm at uh, pammunter.com. And the books, uh, all of them, or four of them, actually, can be found on Amazon.com, of course, like everything else in the world. Um, the most recent one is Fading Fame. You know, the one a couple of years ago was called As Alone As I Want to Be. I think the other books are out of print. I wrote a lengthy story about an obscure movie series in the 40s, and I called it When Teens Were Keen. It was about all these people. That, uh, Movie fans love it, but people who don't know about history don't. <laughs> but it's still out of breath. So I'm not sure what I'm going to do about that one. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Pam Munter, author of the new book, Fading Fame, Women of a Certain Age in Hollywood. The book is on sale now, so go buy a copy. And Pam, thanks for doing this interview. Oh, thanks, Jeff. It was a pleasure. Great. 